powerful, respected, brilliant. Would this have not been possible without the help of another country? To explain, we have to go back, way back to the time of Sukarno. October 17, 1952. The military has planned a raid against Sukarno to dissolve the People's Consul. Sukarno disagreed, saying that it won't be democratic of him to do that. Only General Nasution supported him, making him lose his job. We invited Dr. Azbi Warman Adam to talk more about this. Peristiwa ini memperlihatkan bahwa uh, upaya yang dilakukan oleh militer untuk mendesak Bung Karno itu tidak berhasil. Bung Karno masih mempunyai kekuasaan yang sangat kuat. Nasution was then reappointed as general in 1955 after his replacers didn't suit the job. Fast forward to 1958, General Nasution was really trusted by Sukarno. He was able to change the president's mind by changing the decree to the 1945 constitution. This means the military can join the Indonesian politics constitutionally. By 1962, Nasution was considered the second most powerful person in Indonesia. This made Sukarno uneasy, and as a result, Nasution was replaced by Ahmad Yani as the chief of staff of the ground forces. 1962-1965 The economy in Indonesia was in decline. The politics was getting more and more interesting, especially with the three rumors going around. The first rumor was that Sukarno died on the 5th of August 1965 from a light stroke. The second was that there would be a military coup on the 5th of October 1965, which is on Army Day. And the most enticing one of all is a Gilchrist document. A fake document that was said to be written by Andrew Gilchrist, the British ambassador to Indonesia. The most interesting part of this fake document is that it said, Our local army friend. This had people confused and guessing who that army friend is. All of these rumors eventually led to the 30 September movement. Prior to the movement, there were already two factions in the military, one led by Ahmad Yani and one led by Nasution and Suharto. The first, or Ahmad Yani's faction, is against Sukarno and pro-communist party. The second or right faction, led by Nasution and Suharto, is against Sukarno and against the communist party. Because of the 30 September movement, most of the people who supported Yani was killed, including Yani himself. This is very advantageous to Suharto's faction. The army had a plan in mind. The plan was to use college students to do riots and demonstrations all over Indonesia to take the Communist Party down. It is shown in the President's daily brief that the United States funded the riots with 50 million rupiah. A couple of pages from the President's daily brief stated that the United States donated $2 million for telecommunication. Historians like Dr. Azbi Warman Adam doesn't believe this. Itu satu pesan-pesan pendek yang diberikan dari setiap minggu, dari Senin sampai Jumat kepada Presiden Amerika. gitu. Bantuan itu 2 juta dolar alat komunikasi dan di arsip itu dicantumkan sebanyak dua halaman itu itemnya. Uh, dari alat uh, telekomunikasi itu. Tetapi itu dihitamkan di arsip itu. Nah, saya menduga gitu bahwa ini bukan alat telekomunikasi, tetapi senjata gitu. Karena secara detail, kalau alat telekomunikasi, kalau itu namanya walkie-talkie, kenapa harus sampai 2 juta dolar gitu. Hmm. Tapi mungkin... This was a starting point of Indonesia's and Suharto's close relationship with the United States. Until the riots ended in 1966, there was something really interesting that happened in between. A memoir that was written by Marshall Green stated that on December 15, 1965, there was a meeting in the Chipanas Palace held by government officials about the nationalization of the oil company Caltex. Suharto, not in favor of this, used a helicopter to go from Jakarta to Chipanas to say no to the nationalization of the company. Using a helicopter shows the urgency and the seriousness of Suharto's request. This, again, shows Suharto's alignment to the United States. Sukarno, however, was never really fond of America. He once even said, 
Go to hell with your ace! Because America looked down to Indonesia. Post-30 September Movement On December 1965, the first book about the 30 September Movement was published. It was made by a team of researchers from the University of Indonesia, but it was an initiative of General Nasution. This book was later denied by Cornell University professor Dr. Ben Anderson and two other people. They believe that it wasn't the Communist Party's fault, but instead it was some internal issues with the ground forces. With the help of Guy Pawker from the RAND Corporation and the CIA, Indonesia was able to fight back by sending two people to the United States to write a book about the 30 September movement. Those two people were Ismail Saleh and Nugroho Noto Susanto. Suharto's Rise After the students' riots got out of control, Sukarno gave power to Suharto to calm the situation. Suharto took advantage of this and dissolved the Communist Party. He then took the letter to the People's Conservative Assembly and they decided that whenever the president is absent, Suharto will take over temporarily as president. Sukarno then delivered a speech about the 30 September movement, and that would be his last speech because he was forced to stop being president. So on 20th of February 1967, Sukarno signed his resignation letter, and on 12th of March 1967, Suharto was inaugurated as a de facto president. The Berkeley Mafia at the start of the new order, Suharto was helped by a team of economists that were mostly educated in Berkeley. They got their bachelor's degree in Indonesia, and with the help of Ford Foundation, they got to go to University of California, Berkeley. Mereka yang membantu uh, Suharto untuk uh, merumuskan konsep pembangunan, laksanaan uh, ekonomi di, di Indonesia pada uh, awal uh, Orde Baru. Gitu. The Berkeley Mafia won't get their scholarships if it weren't for Dean Rusk, who was the U.S. Secretary of State. He told Paul Hoffman that they should start educating students from communist countries in the Pacific so that they could exchange ideas. With the help of the Rockefeller Foundation and the CIA, they were able to send some Indonesians to study in top universities in the United States. They do this to try and resolve the communistic ideals in Indonesia and exchange the ways to develop the economy. Sukarno was about to stop sending people to the states to learn because of the ideals that they were learning. But the Ford Foundation threatened him that they will stop all the scholarships if he does that. And so he agrees. After he resigned, Sukarno left a whole lot of debt. Those debts are from trying to nationalize industries, financing the state budget deficit, and making national monuments. The Berkeley Mafia, however, succeeded on improving the economy of Indonesia. We invited Mr. Himawan Wisnu Aji to talk about the Berkeley Mafia and their jobs. They didn't put too much pressure on the economy's growth. Probably this will lead the investment to come, which will open the flow from America to come, right? This led to an exchange of principles of commerce, which in turn led to the development of the Indonesian economy. In the end, the members of the Berkeley Mafia were given a position in Suharto's cabinet. After 31 years as president, Suharto's reign ended in 1998. This was a result of declining economy and extreme corruption cases. Saya memutuskan untuk menyatakan berhenti dari jabatan saya sebagai presiden Republik Indonesia terhitung sejak saya bacakan pernyataan ini pada hari ini, Kamis 21 Mei. Despite the fact that Suharto resigned because of an economic crisis, Suharto gave a great reputation to Indonesia.